I'm here with Alexander McCurse, editor-in-chief of The Duran. Alexander, let's talk about this bizarre letter that was uh, leaked via Iraq, which is saying that the U.S. will honor the parliament's decision, non-binding, and they will pull out of, of Iraq. Esper is denying it. Uh, the, the U.S. Pentagon is pretty much seems to be in a little bit of disarray as trying to figure out exactly, number one, what this letter is, how this letter was leaked. The media is also trying to figure things out. This is a really bizarre story. And I hope you can you know, shed some light as to what's going on here with this letter. But for me, this is once again, the fog of war. We're seeing the beginnings yeah. of the fog of war and the disinformation campaign. I don't know where the disinformation is coming from, whether we're looking at the U.S. military, the mainstream media, Iraq, Iran, who leaked this letter. I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts are, are well, on it either, Alexander, as to how it got leaked or what it means. It's a bizarre letter, though, as well. I mean, I read yeah. through it. A lot of spelling mistakes. Very strange. It's not signed. So no. anyway, Alexander, to me, this is troubling news because once again, it's the disinformation campaign before the real serious stuff happens. And that's what worries me. Absolutely. I entirely agree. Now, can I say, when I read the letter, and this is, you know, at a fairly early stage, I, I assumed it was a fake. Um, it doesn't read like a real letter from someone in the, from, you know, someone in the uh, Department of Defense. It, it, the whole language of it just doesn't, doesn't seem to be true. So I assumed especially given that it was first published in Iraq as part of, you know, uh, uh, on, a, on an Iraqi militia website, that this letter was a fabrication, that it was just one of these pieces of disinformation that, you know, what, you know, constantly circulate in the Middle East. One of the things I would say is the Middle East is an extraordinary place for that kind of thing. You're constantly finding stories that come out of various Middle, Middle Eastern news agencies, newspapers, websites. You must never assume that anything you read in the Middle East is true. So I assumed that this thing had to be untrue and I paid it no attention. And then it turned out that in fact, this letter is in fact an actual authentic Pentagon product. At least that's what the, the people in the Def Defense Department are saying. They're saying it was actually a draft a draft prepared by whom one would love to know and that it was actually a mistake what sort of a mistake made in good faith i mean none of this makes any kind of sense because that would imply that there's this draft supposedly circulating within the pentagon it was then sent despite the fact that it wasn't authorized and was unsigned to someone in iraq this person in Iraq, whoever he or she was, then passed it on to this Iraqi militia, which then published it on its website. Now, that just doesn't seem to me remotely plausible. But, you know, it's not easy to come up with any other kind of explanation. Now, the most plausible explanation, having said that, which I can think of, is that someone has managed to sow confusion within the Pentagon um, about this uh, whole situation in Iran and Iraq and is trying to avoid a war. And I wonder whether that person has, uh, you know, whether this, is an, whether this indicates some kind of disagreement or dispute within the United States, within the US government, about the direction events are taking. It's still very strange. And the other possibility, which I think is an extraordinary possibility, is maybe somebody in Iranian intelligence is behind this, and they somehow found some kind of strange way of inserting this letter into the Pentagon in some way, and then getting it sent back to Iraq. If that is true, then that has enormous implications. It would suggest that the Pentagon's uh, security systems have been compromised. And I wonder why the Iranians would publicize that fact and alert the fact to the US if that really was the case. So it, it seems to me that some kind of dissension 
within the US government is the more likely explanation for this. But it is very strange. And you asked me if I have an answer. I mean, I don't really have an answer. I, I can't really give a simple explanation for this. Well, the Pentagon seems to not be able to give a simple no. explanation no. for this either. So no. if they don't know, no. who the hell does know? Well, but, it, I think I think we need an explanation. I think if we are pushing towards a war situation, which I think we are, and I think your comment, by the way, about fog of war is exactly right. It's precisely when there is war planning that things begin to get scrambled and messages start to become fudged. But if we are moving into a war situation and we're getting all these discordant voices, then I think we need to know exactly how this letter, this draft letter, was produced and by whom. Someone must have written it. I mean, these letters don't write themselves. So who was that person? Yeah, we saw the same antics, the same type of antics right before the run up to to the second war in Iraq with the fake yeah. WMDs yeah. and all the stuff that was going on within the Bush administration as well as they were preparing for this war, as they were preparing for the war yeah. and the invasion into Iraq. Yeah. The Dispatch was one of the first publications to break this story on the U.S. side. Yeah. Let me read you an excerpt from there, Alexander, and then you yeah. can give us your comments. They didn't declare the letter a fake. They're referring to the Pentagon. They didn't declare the letter a fake but they couldn't offer much of an explanation of its provenance or meaning either. Esper pleaded ignorance. I don't know what the letter is, he said. We're trying to find out where that's coming from, what that is. But there has been no decision made to leave Iraq, period. He declined to confirm its authenticity. No, I can't, quoted as saying. General Mealy couldn't verify that the letter was real either. I do know that it's not signed, he said, but I just looked at it right there. It's not signed, end quote. What do you make of that uh, excerpt from the dispatch, Alexander? Well, it, again, very extraordinary. I mean, here we have top officials of the Department of Defense, and they're clearly unable to explain this letter but they're not actually denying that it's real. And the word that we are getting from the Defense Department is that it is an actual letter. It was actually produced within the US military system, within the Pentagon, by someone. And that, as I said, it's an honest mistake by someone acting in good faith and a draft. Who is that person? So, yes. You would assume that if a decision to pull out of Iraq had been made, the, the, the chief of the combined chiefs of staff and the defense secretary would know about it. Clearly, they're saying they don't know about it. Clearly, no such decision has been made or no such decision that they are prepared to go along with. But we have a letter that says the opposite coming from within the Pentagon and which has been communicated officially to the Iraqis who are the host government. So please give us an explanation for this. Now, can I say there are certain very important points to understand about this whole issue of a US pullout from Iraq. Firstly, these US troops that are in Iraq are there at the invitation of the Iraqi government. The Iraqi government its official policy now is to ask for these troops to leave. In fact, there was a meeting between the Iraqi prime minister and the US ambassador just yesterday in which the Iraqi prime minister made that very clear. Now, I say that because there's been some confusion about this resolution that the Iraqi parliament passed there's been debate about whether there was a quorum for that resolution and about whether it was legally binding. The answer is yes, there was a quorum, and no, it is not legally binding. But though it is not legally binding, that is, in a sense, a red herring. It's a side issue because the Iraqi government has now officially said that it wants US troops to leave. And what we've heard, what we're hearing, is that 
cooperation, military cooperation between the Iraqi military and the US military as part of the coalition that was fighting ISIS in Western Iraq, that has now apparently ended. There are no joint operations going on at the moment. Now, the other thing to understand is that we hear a lot about US bases in Iraq. As I understand it, this is something of a misunderstanding. These US troops that are in Iraq, and there's some uncertainty as to how many there are, but it's most people say 5,000 to 7,000. So it's not a huge number, but they're clearly important and they clearly have an important role in all of this. These troops who are in Iraq are not normally located in isolated, entirely US controlled bases. They instead occupy parts of bases that are otherwise Iraqi bases. So you have a large base, you have the Iraqis occupying, shall we say, three quarters of it, and you've got the US with its troops occupying another quarter of it. That's not an unusual arrangement. In Chilik Air Base in Turkey, operates in exactly the same way. It's a joint Turkish NATO base. These are joint Iraqi US bases. So, one possible explanation for this letter is that someone further down the line within the US military hierarchy is concerned about the safety of those US troops. Because with the Iraqi government now clearly signaling that it wants them gone, as I say, that is its official policy. And with those troops isolated in bases where they are surrounded by Iraqi troops, there is a potential for those US troops to find themselves in danger if this situation escalates. And it could be that someone within the Pentagon, generally concerned for the safety of US troops in Iraq, put together this letter, circulated it within these sort of middle ranking people within the Department of Defense, and that somehow, in some unexplained way, it found its way to the uh, government of Iraq. This is to me, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of guesswork here, and I, I, I don't want to say that this is, you know, what actually happened, but it's the most plausible ex explanation I can come up with. And it does highlight how vulnerable these US troops in Iraq are if we have an escalation of the situation there. All right, let me throw to you two oh. explanations that I have, yeah. maybe theories that I have, and you can comment on them as yeah. well. Alexander, the first one is maybe this was done in much the same fashion that all the leaks were done via Ukraine gate, in that you have someone at the Pentagon that is simply looking to embarrass President Trump. So they created this letter, they leaked it to, to Iraq to do maximum damage, Yes, show chaos inside the Trump White House and the Pentagon. So Iraq is the first one to announce this letter, and it just creates all kinds of, you know, just it shows complete incompetence. Yes. No one knows what the hell's going on. So someone yes. inside the Pentagon who hates Trump, which is not uncommon, as we've learned, <laughs> there are a lot of people in the in the permanent state who are looking at any opportunity to embarrass Trump. Yes. So they'll take it. They created this and that's it, it took its course after that. The second theory that I have for you, which you can comment on, is maybe this was done by Israel or Saudi Arabia. And I first heard this theory mm. via Daniel McAdams at the Ron Paul Institute. Yeah. And he floated this idea that maybe a, a spy within the, Pentagon, within the Pentagon via Israel or Saudi Arabia created this letter or concocted this, this idea in order to get confirmation mm. that the U.S. was not leaving Iraq. In other words, because there was this kind of misunderstanding. Are they leaving? Are they staying? And they just wanted confirmation so that they can decide as to the next step as this war unfolds. Right. What I set out was the good faith explanation based on the good faith 
that Esper and the chief of the combined chiefs of staff, the, the, the you know, the, the chairman of the combined chiefs of staff uh, uh, says. Now, there are the bad faith explanations, and I think you've, you've set out two very plausible ones. Now, first of all, um, it's striking that the um, Democrats in the um, in the United States in the Congress are, are criticizing Donald Trump very strongly for this move. And from their point of view, a situation where it looks as if there's confusion within the Pentagon and where there's a possibility of US troops being pulled out of Iraq and they can blame this pull out of US troops from Iraq upon Donald Trump and say that by his precipitate action against Soleimani, he somehow compromised the fight against ISIS. Well, I have to say, I think that's entirely plausible. I know, I'm sure there are people within the Pentagon who uh, um, are opposed to Donald Trump. I would not be in the slightest bit surprised if this is one another one of those leaks that we have seen, which have happened. I mean, again, I, this is speculation. I'm not saying this is what has happened, but it's a perfectly plausible scenario which you have outlined. And I, I, it, it wouldn't surprise me. Now, the other one, which is that it's essentially intended to get the US to deny that it is pulling its troops from Iraq and that it was organized or it was it was done by a spy within the Pentagon. Again, that is a completely plausible scenario. And can I say, if it was the Saudis, it would explain some of the strange language in this letter. Because, I mean, to be honest, the letter doesn't read to me as if it's very fluid, fluent. I mean, I, I would have thought a US military official would write clearer English and would write that kind of letter in a different way. So, you know, if it was the Saudis, that would make complete sense. The only thing that, to my mind, argues somewhat against that theory is that Donald Trump has been tweeting away, uh, threatening Iraq with sanctions and saying that, you know, he will impose massive sanctions on Iraq if they pu you know, push ahead with this idea. So it seemed to me that, you know, Donald Trump was already signaling that um, the US would resist any attempt to get its troops out of Iraq at the request of the Iraqi government. However, you know, it may be if this was some kind of intelligence operation that when it was cooked up, whoever did it didn't realize that Donald Trump would react, would respond in the way that he did. I ought to say clearly that, in my opinion, the U.S. Is, has no intention of pulling out of Iraq. I think if they pulled out of Iraq now, Iraq would fall entirely under Iranian uh, influence. And I'm sure that's not what they want. So I think they're going to try and dig in. And I think they're going to resist any pressure from the Iraqi government to go. And I think that the Iraqi government, for its part, is still very nervous about taking on the United States by openly and straightforwardly insisting that U.S. troops go. So I think, you know, there is a tug of war. There is a push and pull situation. It's obviously this letter has something to do with all of this. But, you know, it, it may be that it was done by, you know, the Israelis undoubtedly have their friends within the Pentagon. I assume the Saudis do also. It may be that it was done by then, by, by you know, but they were behind it. But but, but if they did do it, um, it, it, it probably wasn't necessary because I don't think the US is intending to go anywhere. Yeah, but what does that mean if the Iraqi government says, the parliament says for the US to leave yes. and then Trump comes yeah. back at them by saying, look, either you're going to pay us money, yeah. you know, whatever we spent on the basis, or you have Trump saying that he's going to impose sanctions on Iraq. And to me, that's that sounds even worse because it's basically Trump telling everybody that all of the blood spilled and all the, the money 
poured into the country the three four trillion i've lost count how much has been poured into iraq it's all gone to waste because now you're going to impose sanctions on them yeah i mean it sounds so counterintuitive and to me it sounds like you yeah. have trump on record saying these things and you know the dems pelosi and schumer and all of them and the candidates bernie sanders Buttigieg, you know, Biden, they're going to hit Trump on this, on the campaign yeah. trail, because it, it, the whole thing's unraveling. Well, absolutely. I mean, you're absolutely, I mean, it's, it's a crazy idea. I mean, can we just say clearly, I mean, the Iraqis, the Iraqis asked uh, uh, the US troops to, end, to come back into Iraq to fight ISIS at the uh, where they were, you know, their, their arms were twisted to do it, basically, by the Obama administration. Obama, Barack Obama, was worried that Baghdad was about to fall to ISIS. So he put pressure on the Iraqis to allow the Iraqis to get the Iraqis to agree for the U.S. troops to come back into Iraq to fight ISIS, which they well, did. While he, was, while he was funding well, ISIS, though, to overthrow well, Damascus. Uh, well, exactly. well, exactly. So, I mean, yeah, this is, this, on the one hand, they, was, they, they were, you know, look, green lighting ISIS in Syria, and at the same time, they were fighting ISIS in, in Iraq. I mean, this is, this is the usual chaos. Are we talking about the chaos in the Pentagon now over this letter? I mean, the chaos, the chaos goes far, it's far worse than that, and it goes far earlier than any you know problems about a letter i mean the whole syrian iraqi policy of the united states has been a mess for a very long time and you're absolutely right if the united states then goes ahead and starts imposing sanctions on iraq the country it supposedly liberated from saddam hussein where it was going to establish this great democracy in the middle east then i mean it really is the most extraordinary admission of failure that one can conceive of. I mean, what was all that money spent for if it was if it, if it ends up in a situation where the Iraqis and the Americans have completely fallen out with each other? It, it would completely defeat the entire purpose of that uh, um, of that invasion of Iraq, because not only would Iraq have a extremely unfriendly government. But it was in a situation of conflict with the United States. But if Iraq does insist that those troops leave, the United States will be in a state of conflict with Iraq if it refuses to take those troops out. And as I said, those troops are vulnerable. They are not many of them, and they are in bases where they are, where they are surrounded by Iraqi troops. In such a situation, if, if there is a conflict with Iraq about the presence of those troops, which, to be very clear, if the Iraqis ask them to go and they stay, their presence becomes illegal, and the Iraqis then have legitimate grounds to take action, physical action, to remove them. Those troops become vulnerable and they become potential targets. And it may not be a coincidence that we're now getting reports that the 82nd Airborne Division is heading to the Middle East, because it could very well be that the US is now becoming concerned about the safety of its troops in Iraq. And can, can we say this very clearly, the people who would be threatening the troops in Iraq in that kind of scenario would not be the Iranians directly, it would be the Iraqis. It would be the Iraqi military, both the regular military and the various militias that are connected to it. It would be the Iraqi military, not the Iranians. And you know that, that highlights how precarious and dangerous this whole situation, in a sense, has become. Finally, Alexander, what does Iraq do then? Uh, I'm a little lost as to what Iraq does then. Can they walk back this decision via parliament and say, you know what? No, 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 no. We, we want the U.S. to stay. We've changed our mind. The government. Yeah. We they, want you guys to stay. Can they do that? Or will that just be completely losing face and just yes. look completely weak? Yes. I mean, is, is it really an option? And finally, Alexander, is it really an option to 
tell the U.S. to leave, and if they don't leave, to use some type of force, because then the U.S. is just going to come in and just oh, devastate the, the country again if they want. I mean, in a hard – it's not – it's yeah. that Iraq is in just as hard a position it is. As, as the U.S. is. I mean, they're, they're stuck. And, and the Iraqi prime minister made exactly that point to the U.S. ambassador. He said that Iraq now finds itself in an impossible position that it, it, it's caught between a rock and a hard place, that there is now popular demand on the streets in Baghdad and in the parliament for the US troops to go. And if they don't go and they insist on remaining, Iraq is either going to be humiliated completely and the government, which is extremely precarious in Iraq, its position is far from strong, could very easily collapse or alternatively, if it insists that they go and it, you know, they, they refuse to go, then it could find itself in conflict with the United States, which Iraq, you know, would struggle probably to survive as an intact country and state all over again. So the, the Iraqis are in an exceptionally difficult position. And um, the uh, Iraqi prime minister was trying to get, I think, the U.S. ambassador and the U.S to understand how precarious the situation in Iraq has now become. The country is on the verge of becoming totally destabilized. There's talk that um, with operations, military operations against ISIS in um, Western Iraq, now having ground to an almost complete stop, that ISIS, that, that you know, the ISIS fighters there are starting to regroup again. Um, there is now a great anger within uh, the Shia regions of Iraq at the murder of General Soleimani and at the deaths of these Ira Iraqi para Shia paramilitaries. There is a very strong demand for uh, the US troops to leave. But as I said, if they stay, if they don't go, Iraq is in a very, very difficult position indeed. I think what the Iraqis are going to try and do is they're going to say to the United States, look, take out most of your troops, keep some troops there in a kind of training mission that we can sort of explain away what they're doing and give us a face-saving way out of this. We can't have all your troops there anymore. It's impossible. You've made that impossible for us, but it is not in your interests to have Iraq collapse and disintegrate into more war and to more civil war. When there was a civil war in Iraq, it didn't work out well for you. The Shia regions of Iraq started to turn increasingly to Iran and Iranian influence grew. And of course, the Sunni regions, we saw um, these uh, first Al Qaeda in Iraq, and then um, ISIS emerged. That cannot be in your interests. So cut us some slack, find us a way so that we can save face. We can show to our people in Baghdad that some of your troops are withdrawing, but you know we're not going to look to break all connections with you completely. Whether the Trump administration has the sophistication. To understand all of this, I don't know, but we shall see. Yeah, they need an off ramp. A Alexander, a real quick comment both on side, the both sides do. Yeah, both, that's what I'm saying. Both sides, both they, they all need an off ramp. Because they need an off ramp. Yeah, yeah, they need an off ramp, and they need exceptional diplomacy. And exactly with Pompeo at the helm, God help us. Well, exactly. uh, a real quick comment on the militias and these warlord type of groups that are now reforming yeah. within Iraq, like Sadr. This is also this is a another problem to the situation okay. correct now they're taking up arms as well absolutely i mean one of the things that had happened which was a sort of sign of, of stabilization was that over the previous two years there was there was the first tentative signs that the iraqi state was pulling together finally after the you know it, it collapsed in the in the aftermath of saddam hussein's fall the, there seemed to be a functioning army there seemed to be a functioning state. And what's happened is that over the last few months, all of this has all become, you know, the, the Iraqi state and political system has become rocked. There's been uh, protests against it because it's not 
delivering successfully on the economy. And now it's been humiliated by seeing uh, um, all of these military strikes going on within Iraq. And there's a sense that he's losing control again. And when militias start to reform, and as you correctly say, I mean, you know, that Muqtada al Sadr is talking about re-establishing his Mahdi army, which was the biggest Shia militia grouping at the time of the Iraqi civil war that followed the fall of Saddam Hussein. Countries where there are armed militias are dysfunctional countries, and they are a sign that the government is not in control anymore. If it's no longer the regular army, if it doesn't have a monopoly of, as they say, of arms and violence in the country, then the government is no longer in full control. And it is a very ominous sign that Muqtada al Sadr is putting his Mahdi army together again. It, it suggests the pressure on Iraqis, Iraq's institutions is growing and is intensifying at a, at a very, very accelerated rate. You know, we've discussed the repercussions of the Soleimani death, the assassination, in several videos now. Let me let us let me repeat a point that we made in one of our very early videos. I think there's too much emphasis in some ways about what Iran is going to do in retaliation. The real crisis is in Iraq. Iraq is now at great risk of becoming a battleground between Iran and the United States and between factional groups within Iraq itself. And that would be a disaster for the region. And in the end, it would be a disaster for the United States because it would mean that all the work it has tried to do to try and build Iraq up again as a state had failed. And where there is a crisis in Iraq of that nature, the, the lesson of the Iraqi civil war is because the Shia in Iraq are the majority and because they are aligned with Iran, it is um, Iran's influence that tends to grow. And of course, the US in that uh, uh, civil war that happened before, its troops got caught in the middle and that didn't turn out well for them at all. What a mess. All right, Alex. Well, a mess on a humongous scale. And as I said, I one, one, one longs for some understanding of how great the pressures are in the US. Unfortunately, my impression is that the US doesn't do diplomacy anymore. Once upon a time, it did. I can remember once upon a time, US diplomats who, you know, uh, 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 yeah, just to give two names, Cyrus Vance, for example, who was Jimmy Carter's Secretary of State until Jimmy Carter sacked him. He would have understood all of that. I mean, he had that kind of sophistication. So would uh, James Baker, who was Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State. He had that kind, those kind of people had that kind of sophistication. I, I, Mike Pompeo, well, frankly, no, he does not have that kind of sophistication. He is the architect of this disaster. He's not a diplomat. He's not a diplomat, exactly. He's a bull in a, he's in a bull in, bull in a China shop and he's smashing all the China. I mean, that's what he's doing. And it'll be, you know, lots of people will be left smashed in all the pieces. I mean, it, it, it's very bad. All right, Alexander Mercurse, editor in chief of the Durant. Thank you very much, Alexander. We're, I'm just going to tell everybody to please click that subscribe button. Click the notifications bell. I'm not going to get into BitChute, donations, PayPal, Patreon, any of that stuff. I just want to tell everybody um, that we have tried to think about a way to do something for the fires in Australia, which which I think is a massive, massive story, a massive tragedy and a massive story. I mean, we can't really cover that story. We don't no. know enough about these types of things. No. I don't personally to cover no. a story like that. We've been mm. trying to think about how we can, mm. you know, commit and help out to what's going on. Yes. So, Alexander, you have an announcement to tell all our yeah, viewers I, I, as to how we as the Duran yeah. can somehow help out 
in whatever way we can to the fires that are going on in Australia. So Alexander, what do you have to announce to our users, uh, to our viewers? Absolutely. And now we, we, as uh, our viewers know, those who follow us, we've got various ebooks that we're publishing at the moment. We've, we've got one on Russia Gate. We've got one on Brexit. We've got one on Ukraine Gate. We've got one on uh, uh, the Epstein, 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 Epstein scandal. Uh, so they're all there. And what we've now decided to do is that we're going to uh, uh, remit the proceeds. We're going to, whatever money we make from these, uh, we're going to pass on to uh, the fund for the South uh, Wales firefighters who are combating these fires in Australia. That's our the way. NSW Rural Fire Service. Exactly. NSW Rural Fire Service Brigade. Exactly. 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 Service exactly. Brigade. exactly. Because, as Alex correctly said, this isn't something that we really want know how to cover. This isn't, I mean, we can't really cover firefighting because we are not experienced in firefighting and the whole climate change story is one which we are not is, i mean it, it is well outside our, our range we just we're not able we're a geopolitical and political side we are not a climate change or science side but clearly there is a major emergency in australia and we are going to do whatever we can to help the people who are there so that's what we're doing and we ask people when they buy our books to be aware of the fact that that's what we are using your money for we're going to be sending that money to these people who are fighting these fires and that's the way that the duran and the duran community of which you viewers you our viewers are a part that's uh, uh, that's how we're going to help and that's how we in a sense are going to cover this enormous story. So if I can just say, buy our books, you'll find them enormously interesting. They are, they are the, the Epstein book and the Ukraine Gate book, as I've discussed before, there are two recent books. The one is about the scandal, which the media and the political class are all talking about, which is Ukraine Gate. And as we explain in that book, it's actually a story about nothing because Donald Trump did absolutely nothing that was criminal and I can't even see that he did anything that was actually wrong and this you get situations where you get witnesses who are not even witnesses because they didn't actually see anything and the whole thing is just an absurdity it is it is a massive scandal concocted scandal about something that isn't just not a scandal. It isn't anything. It, it's it's a zero. Whereas the Epstein story is the exact opposite. Here you have a gigantic scandal about massive abuse with real victims, actual victims, uh, victims who I would point out, just remind everybody, it's a fact which people tend to forget, are American citizens, mostly. I mean, these young women who were uh, preyed upon by Epstein and his accomplices were U.S. citizens, and hardly any coverage of it at all. I mean, you know, you get a few, you know, the old story now and then. Uh, Prince Andrew does an interview in Britain. There's now been a more uh, uh, photos shown of his prison cell, and some qu even more questions about the very strange way in which he died. But ultimately. It's just not getting the kind of attention it should be getting. And the point we're making in these books, in these two books, is that ultimately it's because the elites are involved in both these scandals. The elites are behind Ukraine Gate. They're trying to use these allegations as part of the endless war they've been waging against Donald Trump from the moment he was elected. And the elites are implicated, or some members of the elite, are implicated in, Epst in the Epstein scandal because some of them, to be quite blunt about it, were his accomplices and, if you like, I, I, almost the beneficiaries or the participants in his crimes. So they are building up the one and they're covering up the other. That's what those two books are about. So you can read those books, learn about those things, and at the same time, you can support what we feel 
is an important cause and it's our way of saying this is an important story we can't cover it in a video we're covering it in this way but of course it's not just books that we have in our in our store we have our famous magic mugs like this marvelous 15 ounce uh, ma magic mug which i hope you can just see it's got the coat of arms of moscow there um there we go you can see it perhaps a bit better with the double-headed eagle and St. George slaying the dragon of untruth and fake news, which is what we aim to do on our programs. We've got lots of magic mugs, but I would point out this is the second. This this one is, is together with another one, is my oldest magic mug. And you can see that it is in perfect condition. I drink from it every day pretty much because i drink heaps and heaps of golf, uh, coffees and teas all through the day and the night and you can see it's not chipped there's no sign of breaking anywhere the low the coat of arms of moscow there's no discoloration no flaking away nothing and it's light and it's strong and it's easy to hold and they are frankly the best mugs i've ever come across and we in the Duran provide them to you. And we also provide you with our shirts, like the short sleeve t-shirt I'm wearing now with our very own Duran double-headed eagle there. But we also have, as we've often said, other shirts, like my amazing polo shirts, which I was wearing whilst I was doing my at risk ski in a certain bar in Prague sur Arly and uh, um, other long sleeve t-shirts like the kind I was wearing when I was walking my dogs on the alpine slopes doing my amazing Christmas holiday in the Alps. Perfect shirts for all occasions. We've also got t-shirts, uh, we've also got hoodies and hats and stickers, amazing things. You can buy them all from our shop. Alex will tell you how to do it. Just go to the Duran shop. There's a link in the description box down below. You can also go to the eBooks category and I'll put a link in the comments. I usually pin a link in the comments, the first comment there where I link it to the Epstein book and the Ukraine gate book. They also have forwards by Alexander as well. All the eBooks have a forward by Alexander as well. You can pick up those books there. And I don't know how much we'll, we'll, we'll pick up Alexander to donate to the NSW rural fire services. Hopefully it's a significant amount. We'll see how it goes, but whatever you guys purchase as far as ebooks goes, we'll donate it to the NSW Rural Fire Service. And uh, hopefully it's a it's a good amount that it makes some sort of small difference or it provides some help anyway, to that, how, that, that fund. It's how we cover the story and support those yeah. people who are doing an amazing job fighting these terrible fires and putting themselves at great risk. All right. Alexander McCurse, editor-in-chief of the Duran. Thank you very much. Until next time, everybody, take care.